Hi guys, it's Kathleen from A Great Good Place for Books, and I'm super excited to introduce a good friend of the store, Kier Graf. Um, he's been to our store numerous times. Um, he's written three books, and this one's really special because it kind of got its birth during a visit to our store. Um, and we, we went to Canyon and we went on a tour with Esperanza Searles, the middle school teacher at the time from Canyon. And um, this is what happened. And today we have a very special guest moderator. It's um, GGP's own Jossie Kelleher. And for those of you who don't know, she's also the principal of Crocker Highlands. And um, she's such an integral part of the store that you know it seemed absolutely perfect to have her as our moderator today. So let's welcome these guys to the store. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. It's great to be here. So it's nice here. to have you guys. Thank you. Um, so we talked a little bit, and Kier is going to start us off by reading a little bit from his newest book, Tiny Mansion. Um, so let's hear it. This is what they call the cold open in the TV biz. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just. I'll just do a few pages, but this is just from the very start of the book to give people a little bit of a taste. I try to introduce the main character. Uh, it's always important in a book to kind of let readers know who they're going to meet, you know, and, and let them know what that character is going to be like right away. So I tried to do that uh, right off the bat. Okay, chapter one, the house in the forest. The sign on the fence looked like an invitation. No trespassing. Keep out danger. This means you. I know not everyone would see it that way. Some people would see no trespassing and stop right there. Even people who can ignore keep out are probably afraid of danger. And there are always people who will be fooled by this means you into thinking someone specifically wrote the sign for them. But that's not the kind of girl I am. That's why I had one foot on the tall wire fence all ready to find out what was so important that the sign writers didn't want anyone to see it. The forest of gargantuan redwood trees was dark and wild and looked like it hadn't been touched in a million years. I almost expected a left behind dinosaur to come rumbling through, shouldering aside the massive trunks and flattening plants with its giant feet. I thought of an adjective from my stepmom Leia's word a day calendar, primeval, meaning of or relating to the earliest ages in the history of the world. The calendar is three years out of date. My dad, Trent, snagged it out of a dumpster, but Leia didn't mind. She told him she doesn't really care what day it is, but she does love learning new words. I hoisted myself up on the fence and started climbing down the other side, just in time to see the gnome trudging through the field I had just crossed. Dagmar, whined the gnome, wait for me. I dropped to the ground, hard enough to make my feet hurt, and rubbed the red lines the wires had made in my palms. Completely oblivious to the crust of snot on his upper lip, the gnome stopped and stared at the sign. You're not supposed to go in there, he said after he finally read it. The gnome, also known as my five-year-old half-brother Santi, is exactly the kind of person the sign was for. Go home, Santi, I told him. Okay, he said. I'll tell them where you are. Don't tell them where I am. Just tell them you couldn't find me. But I did find you, he said, his eyes round as bottle caps. Welcome to my world. I turned to go into the trees. Later, little man. Wait, he wailed. I stopped thinking, this better be good. I don't know how to get back. Are you serious, I asked. I don't know why I bothered, because I already knew the answer. Santi's the kind of kid who can't find his way to the bathroom without GPS. He nodded. Wait here then, I told him. I'm afraid. Of what? He looked around, obviously trying to figure out what to be afraid of. Cows, he said, because the field was fenced and there were a couple of piles of old dried up cow poop. At least I thought it was cow poop. We haven't seen a single cow since we got here, I told him. They're probably hiding 
and waiting till I'm alone, he said, starting to sound like he believed it. They might stampede. I sighed. If you're so afraid of cows, then come with me. I'm afraid of that. This was getting exasperating. Why didn't Leia ever look after him? But really, he didn't have anything to worry about. Then go home, Santi, I said, turning around again, ready to conquer the mysteries of the primeval forest. You'll be fine. As I stepped into the waist high ferns and craned my neck up at the towering redwood trees, I heard whimpering, a digging sound, and then a wail of misery. Putting my hands on my hips, I turned around for the third time and saw Santi stuck under the fence. Yes, I laughed, but I was also kind of impressed. I didn't think the little guy had it in him. Come on, I said, pulling up the bottom of the fence so he could wriggle through. When he stood up, his entire front side was covered in dirt. We are going to get in so much trouble, he said, as he followed me into the trees. So there we are, starting in scene. Thank you. <laughs> Climbing a fence and ignoring a no trespassing sign. Awesome. So uh, one thing I was excited about when I read this, I didn't know uh, before I read it, but uh, being a resident of Oakland, I was excited to find out that the main character lives in Oakland um, and then uh, later moves out of Oakland, not too far from here, but we're not sure exactly where they moved to because it, it never says exactly where the forest is that they moved yeah. to. Um, so I know you're from Chicago. And so I'm wondering yes. what made you set a book in Oakland uh, and nearby and how did you learn what you needed to learn in order to have Oakland and nearby foresty areas as the setting for your book? Right. It's a long, complicated answer that I'll try to, to condense as much as possible. Um, I do have you know, it, it was definitely not throwing a dart at the map. Um, the, you know, the, the deep, deep background is that um, my mom grew up in Southern California and I, and my grandparents lived there and her big sister moved to the Bay Area, um, settled there as an adult. And so I grew up spending a lot of my childhood, you know, some pretty regular trips to, to Southern and Northern California um, and, you uh, visiting my, my aunt and uncle and their family in this little town of Woodacre um, that people may know um, in, in Marin County. And then after high school, um, I had an adventure where I got in a van with a band and ended up in San Francisco and spent, spent a summer in the area knocking around, um, you know, eating one meal a day until my money ran out pretty much. Um, so I, I have some kind of long-standing but sporadic connections to the area. But really the, the book was was born when, um, so I, I uh, as Kathleen was saying, um, I'd, I'd been to visit a great good place for books a couple of times, had some just wonderful school visits with Oakland schools, just really memorable encounters with kids there. And one of the most memorable was uh, was this trip to, to Canyon School where uh, Esperanza Sorrells gave us this, she was so kind to after, after this like, great school visit at this little tiny school in this wonderful forested area. She took some time out of her day to, to give us a tour of the surrounding area and these amazing houses tucked in away the, around amongst the trees, including some really old trees. And I kind of learned how the, the community had grown up kind of quasi legally and, and, and not necessarily in a zoned way. And, uh, and then I actually bought a book that she recommended to me. I found this old copy of an out of print book about that, the hand hewn you know, homes that of the area. And, you know, my previous two kids books had, were about unusual places for kids to live and uh, adventures that they had kind of based on these unusual places. And I was kind of looking around for my next idea. And these homes, uh, these kind of hand hewn wooden homes in the trees just really sparked my imagination. And, you know, books come together in such complicated ways, but that was really absolutely the birth of it. And then, um, then I was kind of like, well, what's my story going to be? The, you know, what's my setting going to, going to be specifically? Because the, the previous two books, you know, I had a giant, dangerously dilapidated wooden house. Um, then, then I had a, a huge old high rise, like a, a depression era high rise in Chicago. It's actually the one I'm, I live in. I'm, I'm sitting in it right now. That was the basis for the Phantom Tower. And I didn't want to to go big again. I didn't want to have an, I wanted to see if I could have a big adventure in a little tiny house. 
So I thought tiny houses. I mean, I love tiny houses. I love the idea of, you know, efficient design and, you know, little places that fit together like puzzles and all that. And so I started thinking, okay, you know, it was, I was kind of getting these ideas of like a story set in the area and, and using a tiny house, but also maybe some bigger houses set off in the trees, which of course work their way into the story because, um, because Dagmar meets somebody who has built a big old wooden house in the trees. And th those were really the kind of jumping off points. Um, and once I, you know, and then of course the tiny mansion, when I came up with that, I was just like, that title had all the things I look for, which is sort of like a little bit of contradiction in terms right there in the title, which will invoke a question in the reader's mind and hopefully make them want to learn more. And then I started drawing on some experiences and things from my past and remembering this time when I was a kid, my family went to visit an artist friend who was living um, living pretty much in the Redwoods. Um, and I don't know where, cause I was like five or six. Um, and he and his wife were living in a little trailer under these enormous tall trees. And there wasn't room for us to sleep inside. So I slept outside under this tree that seemed like a skyscraper. And I woke up in the morning and I was covered in spider webs. And like all that stuff kind of went into the book in different ways. You know, I drew on a lot of kind of my experiences to, to you know, just try to slot them into ways that were appropriate for this story. And as to your question about research, you know, I try to do just enough research to not screw up because it's really important to me to not be overly specific because I want kids to read a story and see themselves in it. And so I feel like if I, if I got overly specific about, you know, I, with, when I write adult fiction, I actually get much more specific because adults tend to really love that, really, that real specificity. But kids, I feel that if I were to describe a, an exact apartment building or intersection necessarily that Dagmar would live in, in some ways, it's harder for them to see themselves in that story. So I like, I, I want to have just enough detail that it comes alive for them and then not too much. And I was also very purposely vague about the, the forest location because I wanted, you know, partly because I know there are pockets of redwoods all, you know, many different places. But again, I wanted kids to kind of imagine where it might be. And, and also the story is a little bit fantastic. You know, it's realistic, but it's also, you know, the, the chase at the end is maybe a little crazy. So again, making it too realistic maybe detracts from that. I'm sorry, that's such a long answer. Oh, it's okay. That's kind it's of okay. how it all came together. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so I'm thinking about characters. And before I was a principal, I was a teacher. And uh, when I taught kids about uh, writing, <clears throat> narrative writing, and we thought about developing characters, I always would ask them to think about more than just what the character looks like, which is usually the first thing that kids latch on to. And I would talk about how it's important to um, you know, think about what quirks they might have or what habits or interests they yeah. have. Um, think about their family structure. Think about other aspects of their identity um, other than just, you know, she's a 12 year old girl with a brother. Um, so I'm wondering when you yeah. were developing the characters, particularly of Dagmar um, and uh, Blake, who's the, the boy she befriends uh, when, when her family moves into the forest, what did you think about in, in developing those characters? Or, and what do you think well, about was, when you develop characters generally? Yeah, no, oh, that's a great question. And, and character is just obviously massively important to, to any book, but I think particularly to books for, for middle graders because it's, you know, they, they have to identify with this person who's gonna take them through this story. And, um, you know, with Dagmar, I wanted her to be, I, she was, she's one of the, my favorite characters I've ever written. And she's a, one of the characters who really sprang off the page for me. Some writers will say, oh, my characters come alive and they talk to me and all that. And that really doesn't happen to me. Um, a lot of times it just feels like it's, it's craft. It's like polishing the character and, and writing them and writing them until, until they start to feel kind of alive, but they never really talk to me. But that said, Dagmar did come to life in, in, on the page and, um, it was just a character that I just kind of, I could hear her thoughts in my head. I could hear how she would respond to things. And I was thinking about, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of her bravery and kind of, you know, indomitability in some ways comes from, comes from her dad, but you know, it's, it's a kid's book. So that's, that's filtered. 
right? You know, we're all products of our parents to some degree, whether we, we take after them or whether we, 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 we go against the grain. And, you know, her dad is, you know, there's a breed of people in, in the country that, you know, like loves to explore old industrial sites and then, you know, scavenge things and stuff. And he is, uh, you know, he's that guy. He's a handyman. He's incredibly resourceful. They don't have a lot of money, so he's great at repurposing things. And she's accompanied him on all these, you know, some of these kind of foraging raids and stuff. And, you know, we ne I never show that. But from the very beginning of the story, I think it's clear that that has really formed kind of who she is. She's not afraid of fences and she's not afraid of limits. Uh, she's respectful to people, but she is she's a little bit more um, try something first and apologize later, which I just really loved about her. And, and Blake, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately, you know, not to, you know, I try not to make my kids books, you know, too issue heavy, but there are issues in them because they're just issues in life. And, and I've been thinking a lot in recent years about income inequality. And I think that, you know, Blake is really the embodiment of the fact that a kid could kind of have everything that you would outwardly wish for and still, feel kind of empty and and he really does and you know they have a very obviously prickly relationship for a long time and and a, and a grudging friendship at some point and it doesn't come too easily but they are really coming at things just from completely opposite spheres and i and it's really important to create characters that just by nature of who they are uh that will generate conflict and so uh, that was very much on my mind as I was thinking about who Dagmar's foil was going to be. I mean, I certainly came up with her first and then, and, and really then the fact that she would have a little brother that annoyed her as a tag along, because that's something a lot of us can relate to. And then I came up with, with the character of Blake and I was thinking of what about him really is going to make him clash with Dagmar. And I, they really do clash. He's kind of a jerk, but he learned some lessons. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, another thing that I sometimes would talk about with students is that there's a plot to every story, right? And, and most kids, when they read a book, they can tell you this story is about a girl and her family, and they have to leave their home in Oakland, and they go live in a forest, and they meet some people and, and have to do <laughs> some things. And that's, that's what it's about. But then I would ask, what's it really about? Um, you know, right. you started to talk a little bit about income inequality. Um, what are some of the themes like that that you were thinking about that you wanted to bring out through the plot? Yeah, well, I mean, that that certainly is one of, one of the biggest themes that, you know, and, and to me, those things should always just come out very organically because I think, you know, kids are very sophisticated readers. And I, and I, I think that even, and I don't want to say even, but like there are a lot of people who write for fourth and fifth graders who, still feel like they need to have that sentence where they say, and this is the lesson we all learned. And I, I don't ever do that to my readers. I think that they're very emotionally intelligent and I think that they get the bigger point. And, but that was certainly one of the, one of the biggest issues is kind of like, you know, how much is enough? Um, what, can you, what can you be happy with? Um, it's definitely about, you know, connections um, with, with people, right? It's a, it's a family story. It's about a blended family. Um, and it's, and then it's also, which is Dagmar's family, but it's also about Blake's family, which are these people at war with each other, these people who are at war and the source of their, I mean, to an adult, you might say the source of their, their battle is, uh, intellectual property. And, but the real source of it is, is money. And, uh, it, it shows what a wedge that has driven between them. Whereas, um, you know, the, the friction Dagmar's family comes from just a much more normal family thing. Because I mean, you know, a kid wants to spend summer in their hometown around all their friends. They don't want to be, you know, no matter how cool a tiny house is, no matter how fascinating a forest can be, most kids don't want to be yanked out of their their apartment for, and from their friends. And you know, Dagmar is getting texts all the time from her friends having all this fantastic time in Oakland and all this cool stuff they're doing. Um, so that's just a you know. But that's that's not an insurmountable thing for, and that's just a very normal kind of obstacle for a family to overcome. And then, of course, Dagmar's got, you know, her own kind of estranged family member in the, her mom. You know, her mom is this very successful business person who is like traveling around the world and kind of keeps putting her off. And we'll we'll get together soon. And I'll see you soon. Um, so it's you know, I think that more and more kids have to negotiate. You know. They're negotiating a very complicated world just by virtue of being in this world. But you know, 
families are complicated, whether it's a small family that all lives together, but many people have families that are sprawling and, and uh, far flung and, and have all these other issues. So I, I felt that that was something that kids could certainly relate to on just an immediate level while they were kind of absorbing some of the other, other stuff. Um, so thinking again about characters, sometimes I think authors write main characters whose gender identity matches their own. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna presume that you identify as male and your main yeah. character is uh, identifies as female. So I'm wondering how do you, how do you get in the head of a 12 year old girl um, having never been a 12 year old girl yourself? Yeah. Uh, what, wh how do you do that? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it, it's such a it, it, tricky thing. And there's a really interesting conversation going on nationwide right now about, you know, who, who can write which point of view, but to some, to some degree, anytime you write any character, you are going into somebody else's, you know, head or, or their skin or their your viewpoint or whatever. And, um, you know, obviously we have to be respectful about the, choices of characters, you know, whose stories we want to tell. Um, after my first book came out, The Matchstick Castle, um, uh, I, it was really interesting. I, I got an angry letter from a mom that there wasn't a, a, a better girl character in that story. Uh, and I was, I was like, okay, well, <laughs> um, I was actually very consciously writing that book to be a, a not, to, not to alienate girl readers, but to really write a boy book because I had had uh, a good friend who was a middle grade librarian was kind of lamenting like how hard it was to get boys to read and finding books that would really spark boys reading imagination. And I'm the, I'm the father of two boys. And that really pained me to hear her say that. And so Matchstick Castle was really intentionally written as this kind of like, I don't know, like I did really set it in this kind of male, male world, like these, these families that are kind of run and not necessarily in a great way. I mean, they're, they're run by some men who definitely don't have it all together. Um, but that was kind of how I wrote that book. And it was interesting that this, that one of the first responses I got was somebody saying, well, why didn't you write a girl? And so I wrote her back, you know, we had a thoughtful exchange and it was, it was actually really nice. And, you know, I told her what my, my goal had been with that. And of course too, I mean, I am more familiar with the male viewpoint, mm -hmm. but uh, so many of my readers are girls. And th I will tell you that the readers who I get, I have some correspondence, some pen pals from my, among my readers, and they're all girls. Um, so I, I, I am corresponding with young girl readers um, about writing and they're, they're writing their own books and they're asking me for advice about their own writing. And I really wanted to honor them too by giving them a character that, that hopefully that they would fall in love with and you know would, they would really want to, I don't know, just embrace. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as far as how to do that, I think that you, know, you can't be a writer if you don't have empathy and if you're not constantly, considering how others view the world anyway. And certainly having, having been around thousands and thousands of kids discussing writing and reading and talking about my previous books, I feel that that's taught me a lot about how boys and girls view the world. And then kind of in a, in a, a, a funnier sense too, I also write, as I was telling you before the call started, Jossie, so I also write um, uh, adult books uh, with a writing partner named Linda Joffe Hill, and we write as Linda Keir. So I've been writing books under a, a kind of a female pseudonym actually for a while, and I've been with her, I've written adult women characters, and she's always there to call me out and tell me when I got something wrong. And so I've, I would say that that's been part of my education and preparation to write that character as well. And when you're writing a book, um, I know in school, again, I, I have a super school focus, um, we often ask kids to share their work with a peer and get some feedback yeah. from peers. Um, is that part of your writing process when you're not when you're collaborating with someone else? Because obviously that's going to happen with Linda. Um, but when you're writing your own books, um, do you share them with peers to get feedback? It depends. Um, yeah. So the, the books I write with Linda, it's all peer feedback all the time. Uh, my first couple of kids' books, a lot of peer feedback. Um, there's, a, there's a writer uh, named Eileen Cooper who lives here in Chicago, a, a former colleague and a dear friend of mine who's written like 30 kids' books. And she was really, really instrumental into helping me learn how to write for younger readers. She's written everything from picture books to YA. 
and, and middle grade. So she, she really taught me a lot and she was uh, a key reader for me. And then Phantom Tower, I did something a little different. Uh, the Phantom Tower, I workshopped with a fifth grade class at a school just down the street from me here in Chicago. And uh, I just thought, why not get first response from kids, from, from my actual readers? And so I wrote about a third of the book and the teacher was very, very much on board. Kids were on board. And so I gave them the first third or so, and then I would give them subsequent chapters as I wrote them. But what I hadn't really thought through is the fact that they would read much, much faster than I wrote. <laughs> so uh, soon I was getting demands for more pages <laughs> from these relentless readers, uh, but it was great. I ended up really um, keeping my butt in the chair and, and just getting, getting the pages down. And every time they finished a chapter or, or one, or, I give them one or two chapters at a time, they would write their responses down, uh, journal that, which the teacher would collect and save for me. And I would go in about once a week and um, just kind of interview them. Just We would just talk and I would just lead a discussion and ask them, you know, no holds barred. Tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you like. Tell me what's not so funny. Tell me what's interesting. And they were, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Um, not only did they just kind of help me shape the second draft, you know, things to cut, things to tighten, things to improve. They actually gave me some, some plot twists that at first seemed kind of far-fetched. And then I actually ended up writing into the book because I wow. thought if I can do that, that will make the book really kind of more fun and more fascinating. So I actually wrote several like key plot twists in based on things the kids said to me in class. And that was just a magical experience. And I actually remember telling that story. I don't remember which school I was at in Oakland, but I, I remember one of the schools I visited in Oakland with Kathleen uh, one of the kids just looked at me afterwards. He's like, could you do that with our school? And I so wish I could have. It just, it would have been very difficult just because of the distance. Cause to me, I was just walking down the street and visiting these kids. And then as it worked out my schedule, I just couldn't do that for the tiny mansion. But I really hope to do that again, probably for the next book to, to get that feedback and just make sure my ear is still tuned to what the kids are, are wanting to see. Well, if you're ever up for doing that in a virtual context, um, I will volunteer my school. I, I know that we have some readers at my school who would love to do that. That would We be, might uh, have to do that. We might yeah. have to. I, I love that idea. Um, and it's so important for kids to know that uh, they can have that kind of impact on a, you know, an adult published writer. Um, that's a great story. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you, you shared that. Um, and that's one thing I, I always told them flat out after I told that story was like, and that is proof that kids your age can have ideas that are good enough to end up in this hardcover book published by Penguin Random House, you know? And, and you can kind of yeah. see the light up at that. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it's not often enough that kids get that kind of validation um, for their ideas. Yeah. So that's, that's phenomenal. Um, you mentioned before we were um, on the, the webinar that you're working on some other books. Uh, I, I can't remember if you said you're working on two books now. Are, are they for kids yes. or adults or one of each? I'm usually working on, on uh, at least two things at once just because of the fact that I write for adults and for kids. And um, yes, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm working, uh, about to get, I think, any day now, the green light on the next uh, Linda Cure project, which is really exciting, but it's also top secret. Um, and uh, I have... I'm actually kind of behind the game in starting the next middle grade book because uh, I had several ideas and I couldn't decide. <laughs> I was really wrestling and um, the last few months obviously have been a little crazy and unsettling. And so I wasn't quite in my normal headspace as far as writing mm -hmm. and I really couldn't settle on what I wanted to do. And about two weeks ago, I finally it just lit up and I, I it really hit me what the next middle grade book was going to be. And it's actually going to be um, pretty different from, from these, these last three books. Um, I, I never like to do the same thing too terribly long. Mm -hmm. So these, these might, I mean, we'll see, never say never, you know, there might be another fun house book coming up soon too, but, um, if so, I think there'll be an, a, a break in the cycle. So this, this next one is very different for me, but uh, I found a way to kind of, I feel like write about our times in a way that isn't writing about our times at all, that is, that is still an adventure book for kids. And, um, and a, in some ways a bigger adventure and it, it's a very different setting or 
style of book than I've attempted, which is really exciting to me. So I'm, I, you know, I'm not really superstitious about talking about it, things like that, but I probably won't be talking about it publicly for, for some time, but uh, the, the light came on and I'm really excited. That's awesome. Well, congratulations for that. Yeah. Um, we okay. are at a half hour. Um, so I want to thank you for uh, talking with us. Thank Kathleen for the opportunity to participate. I've never done this before. So this was super cool. I enjoyed it very much. Um, Kathleen, any final words you want to say? Here, I just can't wait to see you um, the next time. Um, this was not how we planned it. Remember, no. we talked about this a few a year ago. This yes. was definitely not how we planned it. But, you know, I'm so glad that it's going to live forever on our website. And I can't wait till we get to see each other again in, in person. And Jossie, thank you so much. This was awesome. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Jossie. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait to be back at a great good place for books. I just, I've always had such a wonderful time visiting with you and being, being in that amazing little neighborhood and, and visiting Oakland schools. Um, not how we planned it, but uh, at least this technology exists. Uh, a long time ago, yeah. it would have been on the, a speakerphone, right? Which wouldn't right. have been quite as satisfying. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. You as well. And we'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks, Kier. Thanks, Joss. <laughs> Thank you.